Good morning, church. <clears throat> so, motherhood. God has used motherhood to bless me in many ways. And as I was thinking about how I was going to share about that topic with you today, I had a flashback of a very um, vivid time, um, Mother's Day, several years ago when I was in this space in the sanctuary and uh, the church was lovingly recognizing moms and um, I couldn't handle it all of a sudden. I panicked and ran out of that space and into uh, the bathroom so I can kind of escape. And so I, I share that with you only so that you could hear my heart and know that I have had a breadth of emotions when it comes um, to talking about mothering. Um, and yet today, um, I feel as though God has um, brought us to the right time for me to give witness to those blessings through my personal experiences. So I'd like to highlight those, um, those gifts that God has given to me through my children. So starting with um, my perceptions of what family means or who it includes, um, that was shaped in my early childhood through the many uh, foster step God cousins that I have um, and other individuals who are not biologically related to me. Um, cousins, um, grandmas that were neighbors, uncles and aunts who actually just were growing up with my parents and <clears throat> not actually blood relatives. All of these people were regarded as family. So it shouldn't be a surprise to hear that um, there was no one single big moment when I was um, choosing to be an adoptive mother. I was always the kid that was holding babies and toddlers in the church nursery and I was the teenager who um, babysat everybody's kids. Um, I was probably about five or six when I decided to be a teacher. Um, I even married a pediatrician. My <laughs> incredible husband is um, an adoring fan of children too. So I, I always knew I would be a mom. Um, I just didn't know how God was going to make that happen. So uh, in June of 2006, nearly 15 years ago, um, my first baby was born. Uh, Latrice came home from the hospital at four days old, um, and it was about three hours after I even knew about her existence um, or even the possibility that we would be having a baby. My husband and I had signed up for um, caring for a child with an organization that provided something like pre-foster care. Uh, we were kind of expecting to care for an elementary aged kid for just a couple of weeks, so Tracy was a complete surprise and a total miracle. Her story, uh, our story together, really is long and complicated. Um, and yet it's one that I, I do share willingly um, because it is a part of my life that I wouldn't trade for the whole world. Um, Tracy is the one, she's the first one who made me a mama. Uh, because of a rare genetic disorder, uh, Tracy died at a little over three years old, um, much later actually than um, everybody was expecting. Um, each day that she lived was a miracle and um, she was that miracle. Partly due to her death, but mostly because of her life, um, God taught me how to cherish as a mother. Loving God and loving people are the commands I strive to follow daily, and a specific application of that love is to cherish my family. Often for me, this has looked like hundreds of moments when I am in um, a space where I simply just let soak in whatever it is that is in my present, whether that's Reed's giggle or Elle's deep question or um, B's funny face or awesome dance move, um, sweet song, all of these, I just let it soak in. My kids have grown up with a mom who regularly stops and allows herself to be overcome by the goodness of what God is doing now. And that is a gift from Tracy. We never knew how long she would be on the earth or with our family. Um, and God taught me much through her about how God is outside of time and about cherishing. Cherishing is also about intentionality and in cultivating care. So it was with much purpose and intentionality that I began mothering Reed, my now 14-year-old biological son. 
to be honest, um, parenting Reed as a baby, toddler, and a young child was actually pretty easy. He was a really good kid and fun to be around, and I had had a lot of experience already. One thing I didn't have a lot of, though, was empathy. Um, and I can still <laughs> tear up at the, at the many memories that I have of watching Reed perceiving that somebody was hurt and then <clears throat> reaching out to them and then sharing in that pain or suffering as a form of God ministering to them through him, to me often through him. It's through this gift of Reed's empathy that I have better learned to walk alongside others. And it is a gift that I still see in him. Through each of my children, God has taught me about my identity. Becoming a multiracial family with Tracy set into an action, uh, set into action an ever-growing um, mindset for seeking justice for all as a part of my identity. Um, building up an underdeveloped sense of empathy through Reed's example highlighted the differences that I have with my children in my identity. And when my middle child came along, I'm a middle child, um, so when my middle child came along, Elliot, God, God really used our similarities, actually, to lead me to become more self-aware in my identity. Now at 12 years old, El probably has no idea the countless times that God has spoken to me through him, through his confidence, his independence, his um, potentially very risk-taking behavior. <laughs> um, sometimes I watch this smart and funny kid and I just wonder, um, as I watch him wonder and ask deep questions about the, the world. The amazing thing is actually what comes next when God looks at me and says, see, you're like this, and I love you, and you're mine. Keeping me firmly identified as a child of God has been a gift from Elliot. And it is with that tender spirit that God brought us Phoebe Love. Her name means brilliant and shining and she lives into that every day, flooding the world with God's love and light on everyone around her. When we joyfully adopted Phoebe at birth, God was already at work using her to teach me more about time and sharing. The four of us had waited for several years for her. And the longing that I felt during that waiting season was so intense. Um, and sometimes it was actually misplaced. Um, when I protectively encircled my arms around my boys, um, literally and figuratively sometimes, um, it might have been at times um, more about a lack of trust of God and uh, his goodness than cherishing. And I sometimes was greedy with my love. And in reply, God's gift was Phoebe, my seven-year-old daughter, um, one of the most generous humans I've ever met. Her examples of generosity have helped me learn to share physical things, emotions I have, stories that I've lived that would bless others. And I'm even learning to share the title of mother with her bio mom, Laura. Yeah, do you see God's gentle touch here? <laughs> At times when my cherishing might become so soured because of my heart selfishly grasping at something um, instead of tenderly holding it, that's when God has used Phoebe's generous, um, her generosity and the example of generosity to um, remind me that God has no shortage of love. God doesn't work out of scarcity. There is an overabundance of it. So I, time it again, turn to the assurance of Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's from Romans 8, 38 and 39. And I choose to respond to that love as the psalmist did in Psalm 5-7. Uh, but I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your temple, your holy temple, in the fear of you. My journey through motherhood has been anything but linear. 
Um, it feels like it has jumped in and out of time and circled back around as I learn and relearn these gifts um, from my children. God has shown me much about myself through my kids and their gifts. How to cherish, grow in empathy, root my identity in God, and become more generous and trusting in God's overflowing love. I truly am blessed beyond measure, and I'm grateful beyond words for God's gifts of and through my children. Thank you. Good morning, Rainier Avenue Church. Um, happy Mother's Day, Feliz Dia de las Madres to every mom, aunt, grandma, and just every mother figure in each and every one of our lives. There are so many of you, and I know in my life there are so many that if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be the person that I am today, and I wouldn't understand who God is without your prayers and your unconditional guidance and love. Today I just want to talk about what a mother's role means to me what my mom means to me, what all these women that have shaped who I am means to me. And I just want to talk about first about God's love, right? Um, I think a lot of the times when we think of God's love, we compare it to our earthly fathers and we say, well, God's love is like our father's love on earth. And I think for someone that didn't always grow up feeling her earthly father's love and I love my dad, but we have had a difficult relationship and God has really worked through that. I think growing up, it was always difficult to, to understand what that meant because I was really hurt um, and felt like I didn't receive that love that, that people said the father's love was. And I think that's where my mom really stepped in. My mom has always been the person that has guided me. And um, I've learned two very big traits from her and they've really shaped my idea of what a mother's love is and what God's love is and it's two big things that I wanted to talk about was just unconditional love and support and also courage courage to step out and to be the person that God has designed and created me to be and I think the first one talking about unconditional love and support I want to talk about a story that I can remember it was my junior year of college, and I remember I was having just a difficult time in school. It was finals week, and I was just burnt out. And and I was also, I think, having just, like, relationship drama. And and I think for me, I remember just calling my mom, and because my mom's the person that I go to. And I remember just calling her, and, and I'm not usually someone that cries, but I remember just crying, and... And I think she picked up the phone, heard me crying, and was like, what's going on? What happened? And, and I remember just telling her, I, I just don't want to be here. I want to go home. I, I'm tired of school. It's not, it's not worth it. I just don't want to be here. And this is my second semester of junior year, me having this breakdown, which I feel like a lot of people can relate. Like, finals week is stressful. You have a few breakdowns, and, and you get it together. Um, but I remember just calling her and, and expecting her to say, well, you've got this, you can do it. And, and she surprised me because she said, well, if, if you want to come home, you can come home. That's okay. You can drop out of school. It's not the end of the world. We're here for you. I'm here for you. And I remember just feeling an overwhelming sense of support and love through that. And I remember responding and just being like, well, I can't do that. That's not realistic. I need to go to school. And, and I remember that really helped me to just realize what was happening, that I was okay. But I think that's the first example that my mom has showed me. And, and I've seen that throughout my life, right? That she has always shown me this unconditional love. That I could have dropped out and she would have been very supportive because she understood my heart she understood who I was and and what I needed in that moment um, and I think the other example of that my mom has shown me of of love and just courage mostly has been um, 
through just her courage to step out. And I also want to talk about my favorite person in the Bible. Her name's JL. And if you haven't read the story of JL, I would really encourage you to. It's such a beautiful story. But basically, the king comes to Deborah and he, and he tells her, Deborah, I need you to come into war with me. And Deborah's a prophet, and she tells him, if I go into war with you, King Barak, then God's not going to give you the victory. He's going to give it to a woman. And so he goes into war with Deborah, and out of nowhere comes this woman that you don't see about, you don't hear about, you don't even know who she is, and her name's Jael. And it's found in Judges 4, 18 to 21. And it says, Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord. Come right in. Now, Sisera at this point is um, is the king on the opposite team, and he ends up fleeing from the war. And so he comes to Jael's house, and she invites him in. And she tells him, don't be afraid. So he entered, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skim of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone there, say no. But J.L. Eber's wife picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Now, Jael's a woman that has nothing to do with the war. Um, but the war comes to her. The king that's fleeing Barak and Deborah and the whole army. He comes to her to find refuge, thinking that, he won't, that she won't kill him. But instead, she, she finds the courage and says, I'm going to, you know take this into my own hands because the war has come to me. And I love this example because even though it's gruesome and it's not maybe beautiful, it shows the beauty that, that God has given, I think, a lot of women and mother figures, especially in my life. That my mom has gone through a lot and she came, you know, from Mexico to the U.S. with nothing, not knowing the language. And she's gone through these hardships in her marriage not asking for them. She didn't ask to be in, in a marriage with someone that was adulterous, maybe. She didn't ask for a lot of these hardships. She, but she still stuck through them and found courage. And she said, God, I don't know what's going on, but I trust in you. And so if there's anything that my mom has taught me, it's the father's love of unconditional support and of courage. I know that there are so many women out there in my life that have really shown me, you can do this. God can carry you through this. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that and um, hope that you find some love and courage in your life as well. And I just want to say thank you to all the moms out there, all the mother figures that God sees everything that you've gone through and and there's so much beauty that that you hold and carry. Good morning, Rec family, and happy Mother's Day. My name is Shatea Whitney, and I, along with my husband Troy and our two wonderful sons, Caleb and Joshua, have been at Rec for the past 13 years. I've been asked to share with you a little about my journey as a mom. And when I told my husband that I'd be doing this, he said, I hope you won't focus on the challenges. Here's the thing. There are a lot of moms at RAC who have been able to conceive without any miscarriages, who haven't had health challenges, whose kids haven't had health challenges, and who could pretty much feed their kids anything and everything, and they would magically grow and thrive. But that's not my story. My story includes the miscarriage of my first child, an emergency C-section with my second born, 
dealing with food allergies and feeding issues for the past 16 years, continuously working through my own health issues and medical mysteries while also trying to solve my kids' medical mysteries, um, also homeschooling for three and a half years when the school system was failing my kids, all the while running my own business as a licensed marriage and family therapist supporting others in their life challenges. But no, I am not going to focus on the challenges. I want to focus instead on those who have inspired and supported me on this journey. It does indeed take a village, and praise God, I have had one. Before I found the amazing naturopaths and functional medicine doctors who have helped me to regain my health and who I definitely put into my village, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and my heart would have slowed down to an absolute crawl. My blood pressure would have dropped to below 90 over 50 and I would have stopped breathing and this would cause me to panic. And what I remember is that being afraid every night um, that I wouldn't wake up again, the thing that would soothe me would be that Troy would hold me and I could lay my head on his chest and listen to his healthy heartbeat and I would relax enough to sleep, the scariest task of my day every day. So first of all, I'm grateful for my husband uh, and for his presence throughout this journey. In addition to my husband, I had mom to mom. Mom to mom was what brought me to REC. And I would say that in the 10 years that I led mom to mom, I was the biggest receiver of the loving, supporting care that is offered by mom to mom. At mom to mom I was not the therapist. I could be completely free to share all of my fears, all of my challenges, my pain, my worries, and I got just what I needed every week to keep going and to press through. And I am beyond indebted to you incredible women who have supported me on this sometimes quite harrowing journey. But today in particular, I would like to honor the two constant supports I have had throughout my entire journey as a mom and indeed throughout my entire life. Through it all, they have been a continual source of wisdom, love, and strength. And those are my mom and the Holy Spirit. My inspiration for motherhood was always my mom. She didn't receive much mothering herself and was basically entirely on her own and raising her baby brother by the time she was 16 years old. But in spite of all that, she gave me the most beautiful, idyllic childhood that I could have imagined. And I always thought, when I grow up, I want to be like my mom and I want to offer my kids all that she's offered me and nurture my kids in the way that she has nurtured me but I never thought I could be as good a mom as my mom had been and she would always say you'll know what to do just follow your instincts and she also balanced that with her favorite verse in the Bible which is Proverbs 3 5 and 6 trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Well, when I became a mom, I actually thought my mom had completely led me astray. I was in over my head almost immediately. Even the simplest, most basic of maternal tasks, feeding my children, I found myself ill-equipped for. Motherhood has asked and required of me to operate in all my areas of weakness instead of in my areas of strength. So I didn't think I actually had these great instincts that my mom said I would have. And though it's taken me years, in hindsight, I can see that my mom was not wrong. I didn't know what I was doing most of the time, still don't, and I continually still feel woefully inadequate for the task. But following my instincts, along with crying out constantly, 
to the Lord and continually asking and seeking and knocking have indeed been enough. And I'm going to give you just a few examples of this. I would give you more, but don't have time. First example, when my firstborn son, Caleb, was a newborn, he was covered in eczema. He would be extremely fussy every time he ate and gassy and in pain, and sometimes he would projectile vomit. And eight to ten times a day, he would have diarrhea. And the pediatrician diagnosed him with colic. And I had such amazing maternal instincts that I knew that was not right. Um, whatever minimal instincts are needed to know that my kid was in pain. I knew it. I never gave up and I never stopped searching for answers. And eventually I figured out that Caleb was allergic to milk protein. I was able to get all of those milk proteins out of my diet and he cleared up. Praise God for wisdom from the Holy Spirit and for following my motherly instincts and not assuming he had colic. Another example, when I was 28 weeks pregnant with Joshua, one morning I woke up and my eyelid was swollen. I had no other symptoms, felt absolutely fine, but my instincts told me that something was not quite right. I went to the doctor and long story short, by the evening I was admitted to the hospital with severe preeclampsia and two days later, Joshua was delivered via emergency C-section. Three months premature. Praise God for his wisdom and for my instincts. Because hours later, the swelling was totally gone and I continued to feel fine. So if I hadn't gone to the hospital and I did, I would not have had enough time for them to give me the two shots that they gave me uh, to help Joshua's lungs to work and because they were able to give me those two shots Joshua was breathing room air from day one Even at less than two and a half pounds. Okay, one more example and this is with regard to my kids education um, throughout his schooling Joshua struggled a bit with um, math concepts and he was not at grade level this is part of the reason that I homeschooled him and even after I put him in middle school public middle school for uh, sixth grade I continued to classify him as homeschooled uh, in order that he could take math at home in sixth and seventh grade and I did this in spite of the fact that the school kept telling me that kids have to be at grade level or they will not make it through math they will not ever catch up and uh, my philosophy was if he doesn't actually, um, if he's not allowed to go at his own pace, he won't be able to get these concepts and you'll just push him through. Anyway, long story short again, Joshua went at his own pace and in eighth grade, even though he was not a grade level, he was able to take math in school. And at the end of eighth grade, when he received his certificate, he also received one award. And that award was in math. And that's not all. Joshua is now a Hazen Highlander at Hazen High School. And um, last month or two months ago, Joshua was nominated for Highlander of the Month by none other than his algebra teacher. And not because he had the best grade in the class, but because he was the best student. He was diligent. He was considerate of others. He's, he's the kind of kid who makes his teachers want to get up every morning and teach. And I, I could go on and on about how proud I am of my kids and um, how much they've persevered through their challenges over the years. But um, I do want to stay on topic and just say thank you, Mom for teaching me to follow my instincts. And thank you, God, for being attentive to my cries. And to all of you moms out there, feeling like your best is not good enough. And even if it were, how in the world would you know, considering that you haven't even seen your best self since you were single and could get a good night's sleep and didn't carry the weight of the world on your shoulders? To you, I wanna say that my mom was right. Trust your instincts 
and daily cry out to the Lord and he will direct your paths. You are not alone. You are doing an incredible job, the hardest job you will ever do in this life. And the Lord will be with you every step of the way. And I want to leave you with a couple of verses um, from the Psalms that the Lord has given to me over the years. Um, the first is from Psalm 34. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. And the second is from Psalm 91. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. God bless you, and happy Mother's Day.